now we're going to uh, go to Steve Murphy uh, from Boston again, who's going to talk about uh, some of the problems that can be encountered with timber servicing. Good morning again. Um, it's a pleasure to come back and speak to you um, about this topic. I think as time has gone on, we've talked about the problems with hip resurfacing over the years, and as of 2010, it's become even easier to uh, discuss this issue because so much information is now available. I'd like to acknowledge a few people, Don Howie from Adelaide, Australia, and the group from uh, from the University of Oxford in England who provided some very detailed uh, and rather recent information. Um, there's a few things I'd like to quickly run through today. Um, one is that hip resurfacing has a reduced impingement free range of motion, has a higher incidence of hip dislocation, a higher incidence of groin pain, unnecessary soft tissue dissection in order to perform the surgery, limited abilities to correct more significant offset and leg length issues, a higher incidence of cup loosening, an incidence of femoral neck fracture, a higher incidence of sciatic nerve palsy and dense sciatic nerve palsy, increased failure rates and dysplasia, increased failure rates and osteoporosis, increased failure rates overall, metal hypersensitivity and pseudotumor, and very, very poor outcomes in revisions in patients who had revisions for pseudotumor formation. <coughs> So looking at hip instability, for, for some reason there was an assertion that hip resurfacing was more stable and less likely to dislocate than a total hip arthroplasty, but that was actually never true. There's very good uh, mathematical equations that can predict what the maximum range of motion of an articulation is, and it has to do with the neck diameter, the head diameter, and the arc of the cup. And uh, simply put, the head-neck ratio of uh, hip resurfacing is rather poor, and so of course the uh, impingement free range of motion is much less. And if you look at a typical total hip arthroplasty with just a 32 millimeter bearing, the uh, free range from one edge to the other is 136 degrees. And if you model a 50 millimeter head with a 44 millimeter neck, the actual edge to edge motion is only 69 degrees. And you can just see that the poor head neck ratio is the thing that leads to reduced range of motion and impingement. And uh, what this does actually is it leads to a number of things. Limits the motion, causes impingement, can possibly cause groin pain, causes it to lever and dislocate, and also the impingement can lever the cup out before it has ICU integrated. So in fact, if you look at real dislocation rates, there was a large study that was presented by Mont in 2007. The dislocation rate was 1.8%, and that is a dislocation rate which is commonly reported with hip resurfacing, and if you look at any of the tissue preserving techniques, whether it's an anterior, anterolateral, or posterior capsular preserving surgery, or even capsule repair surgery, they all have lower dislocation rates than hip resurfacing. Now, um, so getting to that point, one reason is that they have reduced range of motion, so this causes impingement, but why else do these hips dislocate more often? Well, in order to do the surgery, you have to destabilize the soft tissue envelope to a greater extent than you would have to to do a total hip replacement because, of course, the head is in the way, and so you have to mobilize it to a greater extent than you would have to for a total hip replacement. Another issue, groin pain is much more common after hip resurfacing than it is total hip arthroplasty. Uh, ben Nasser and Bole just published uh, uh, this month an 18% incidence of groin pain uh, and most had limitation of activity and most took anti-inflammatories for the symptoms. Why do they have groin pain? Some of it may be related to mental hypersensitivity, some of it may be related to impingement of the psoas tendon or against the rim of the socket, uh, and of course many of these cups are large and uncovered in the front, which may lead to some of this problem. What we do know is that it is much more common. In terms of uh, soft tissue dissection, there's a big focus on bone preservation, but there's a lack of focus on soft tissue preservation, and the soft tissues are an incredibly important issue, and if we can reconstruct the hip without violating the soft tissues unnecessarily, then the hip joint, of course, is much better off at that point for function and in the future for revision. And uh, there is just tremendously greater soft tissue dissection that is required for hip resurfacing than for some of these tissue-preserving total hip arthroplasty techniques. And so I would submit to you that this is unnecessarily excessive soft tissue violation 
for a reconstructive procedure in 2010. Um, it was just shown recently by Jim Powell that uh, leg length and offset can be reconstructed very well with hip resurfacing in simple cases, but obviously in complex cases it has been clearly shown by Silva that the biomechanical restoration is much more limited in hip resurfacing than it is in hip arthroplasty. Now, why do cups loosen more often? Well, um, certainly we have a limitation of supplementary fixation. There is a tendency to oversize the cups in some cases to make sure that you don't notch on the femoral side. But more importantly, I think bone grows into cobalt chromium much more slowly and much less completely than it grows into titanium. And of course, we are, we are stuck with cobalt chromium uh, surfaces on the backside of most of the hip resurfacings. And of course, it's much more difficult to get auxiliary fixation in these monolithic cups. In addition, early on, because of the thick neck, if the cup is fairly horizontal and the neck impinges against it, it can cause the cup to loosen right away and fail to osteointegrate, which is one of the reasons why the cups fail at a higher rate. And if you look at animal studies, it's not only does uh, bone grow into titanium much more rapidly than it does to cobalt chromium, but uh, the shear force is to break the uh, junction between the osteointegrated surface and the bone is much less for cobalt chromium than it is for titanium. And then, of course, you have the problem of femoral neck fracture. Now, the femoral neck fracture rate in men it has been 1%, which is not very high, but it's 1% more than it would be otherwise. And certainly in the women, it's at least twice as high. And this has been shown in many, many studies and is related to bone strength, notching, stress shielding, um, and component loosening. 